Ladies and gentlemen, that's my name, Tony Allred. It's a bit of a deception, that name. The manager does much by doing little because it's actually a kind of a prequel. I'm going to give you the inspiration for that. But you'll understand at the end what, I'm, what, it, what it is I'm getting at. Okay. Now, anybody who know, knows who this fine, uh, well-bronzed gentleman is? No? You want to know who he is? That's who he is. <laughs> Are you any the wiser? He's got a grander title. The Honourable Sir John James Cowperthwaite, KBCMG. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this guy. Uh, he is a personal hero of mine, and he's been an inspiration for me all my, all my working life. And uh, maybe you'll see why at the end. But who was he? He was a classicist and economist, a Scotsman, I believe. Uh, and he ended up as a, well, ended up, his working career was as a colonial, colourless colonial civil, civil servant in Hong Kong. Uh, over those dates, 45 to 71, that was pretty much his whole career. Uh, I should add, uh, you know, <laughs> full disclosure, I spent my childhood in Hong Kong and, and during that period, not all of it. Uh, he seemed to have had, as a young man, an extremely enlightened boss because uh, the boss asked him a question that almost defined his life. He was asked, this was just after, just in 1945, after the war, and Hong Kong is in a terrible state. And he was asked by his boss, I want you to find ways for the government to boost the post-war economy. Now let's have a look at uh, what the... Okay, that's what Hong Kong looks like. It's just a dot at the bottom in the south, uh, southeast of China, and it comprises, a, uh, it comprises a, a mainland area like that, the big thing. Hong Kong Island, where most of the business is done in this Lantau Island, a huge island that has only recently been, uh, to some extent, populated. Now, the Japanese invaded from the north. They'd already occupied uh, China for many, many years. And on Christmas Day in 1941, they marched into Hong Kong and took it over. Uh, they locked up um, anybody of any influence if they didn't kill them. And uh, they basically oppressed all the local people there. They plundered, their w they basically only plundered for, 20, for, for the four years of occupation until one day uh, somebody very nicely dropped two atomic bombs on Japan and they gave up. And they surrendered in 1945 and this little picture shows a little fellow saying goodbye to the last Japanese aircraft like this. So, so the war ended and then you have Hong Kong in the 1950s. What was it? It was just a rocky outcrop really with no natural resources, only people. And, but it did have this harbour here, a very good deep water harbour, but that was really the only thing in terms of natural resources. Recovering from the devastation of what the Japanese did to the place for four years. Abject poverty, and it was inundated with a constant stream of <coughs> refugees, Cantonese, coming from, uh, fr from China. And to remind you why they were coming from China in the 1950s, uh, there's a little chart of the world's most deadly tyrants and Mao Zedong is this guy. He is the, he's history's most evil man. He killed between 50 and 70 million of his own people through slave labor, man-made famine, and executions. More than Lenin, Stalin, Hitler, the whole lot. So you understand why they were trying to flee him. So they were very poor. These are just a few photographs of, uh, of Hong Kong in those days. Uh, a lot of poverty. There were ghettos uh, in the town. Uh, people camped on the shacks on, on hills like this. And, uh, and whenever there's a typhoon, I remember seeing the headlines of the paper, you know, typhoon comes, such and such a, a hill has been washed away with uh, half, the, half the refugees that were living on it killed. So it was a pretty, pretty grim place for, uh, for, for these refugees in particular. In their, not in the hundreds of thousands, in their millions. That's a little economic picture of the 1950s. And you see that the, the population there starts, one, well, starts at 1.6 million and it goes up 80% to nearly 3 million in that 10 years or a little bit over 10 years. But look at the GDP. That, this is GDP per person. Notwithstanding the huge population increase, the GDP also went up per person, which is quite remarkable when you think of it. And there was a lesson not lost on our friend Mr. Culperplate. Now, that's the same little chart I've just shown you, but just squashed up. And if we expand it a bit, these are the years that Calpathwaite um, worked in Hong Kong initially as a junior civil servant in the finance department. He ended up as a, what they call financial sec secretary, which is like finance manager. 
Uh, and that's, that he set the tone during that period about how to manage Hong Kong's economy. And it's a tone that ha has continues to this day. That is the Cowperthwaite legacy. You see the population continue to scream up. It's gone up 350% at the top of the graph there, 7.1 7, uh, 7 million. And, uh, and the GDP from you know, $2,000 to $50,000 per person. An unbelievable uh, growth picture. Okay, so thus Hong Kong became the ultimate global city, if I can borrow that phrase from Raymond for a moment. So the question is, how did, how did this guy, this boring old fat fellow there, unleash such energy? What was his big idea, the big idea that persists to this day, that, that gave such spectacular results for almost every individual? How was he able to answer the question that he was asked, find ways for the government to boost the post-war economy? Well, he discovered, as we saw in that first chart, he discovered that Hong Kong's con economy was already recovering swiftly with no government help. Now, I think most politicians would look at that and say, well, if it's recovering this fast with no help, imagine how fast it will recover if I give them help. But he actually drew the opposite conclusion. He says, they don't need government help. And he invented this uh, phrase, non-interventionism, and he made it his personal credo and when he eventually got the top job, which he then held for 10 years, he turned that into Hong Kong's guiding economic philosophy, which it still is to this day, non-interventionism. Of course, non-interventionism is a bit extreme, it isn't really. But it's, it's basically keeping intervention to the minimum. But always, and this is something often forgotten about Hong Kong, always within the, the Magna Carta co uh, precepts, you know, of habeas corpus, common law, equality, innocent till proven guilty, independent judiciary, Contracts are sacred, private property is sacred, free speech is sacred. Really, really important uh, underpinning to, to, to Hong Kong's success and the success of any economy for that. So for 10 years as financial secretary, he did nothing, almost. He concentrated on, he even prevented his civil servants sometimes from looking at statistics in case they got all enthusiastic and wanted to do something. <laughs> so he basically, so get the government the hell out of the way, let let private enterprise flourish, and flourish it did. He kept taxes very low. I mean, the maximum, the luxury, the top rate was 15%. By the way, the top rate today is 17%. It's hardly moved, and it's nice to compare that with Ireland's 52%. Uh, so with those low taxes, nevertheless, he just watched the tax revenues went up and up and up. So he's getting big revenues uh, while the businesses soared. He had some tremendous turns of phrase, and this is probably his most famous quote, and it's worth just reading and thinking about a little bit. In the long run, the aggregate of decisions of individual businessmen exercising individual judgment in a free economy, even if often mistaken, will do less harm than the centralized decisions of government. And even, <laughs> and certainly whatever harm it does, it's likely to be counteracted faster. I think we'll see the Tesco's problems now, they'll be recovering from those problems faster than any economy, national economy would recover from such problems. Here are a few other nice little aphorisms that I thought <coughs> would be nice to share with you. You know, the less a government does, the less damage it does. In an infant industry, and I would say with that also, uh, if coddled, or you could say if subsidized, it tends to remain an infant industry and never grows up or expands if it's, if it's coddled. And when government gets, decides to get into a business, it generally uh, makes it uneconomic for anyone else. This is a very important one, too. He said, since our predecessors passed no debts onto us, we don't have a right to pass debts onto our successors. So he's not a believer in passing big debts, uh, in building up big deficits. And, of course, our low taxes have helped generate uh, this economic expansion in the face of very difficult circumstances. Of course, because he did nothing, he had a clear desk. You know, they say a clear desk is a sign of a sick mind. Well, he had a very sick mind. <laughs> he didn't work much. I believe he got home on time. Just a small personal declaration. My father was his dentist. <laughs> he always, this guy always went home before my father went home. Uh, but the guy had a huge social conscience of two big themes. This is interesting. The public services, because remember, this is Hong Kong refugees living on hillsides 
he said public services we need to gear them to low quality low cost whoever says public services we want low quality of public services we all want high top of the class you know best in range high quality no lower, qual lower cost lower quality because then you can spread it wider and it's better to give a low quality service to a lot of people than a high quality service to a few and if you think about it we have a modern day example Ryanair the whole business model is built around trying to lower the quality of the service. So now we have to book our own seats, we have to check in ourselves, uh, you know, they don't give us any food and all this crap that Ryanair throws at us. But the idea is they're trying to get their costs down, which allows them to spread their customer base. It's the same idea. Okay, that was public services, but then there was the, this other thing, there was people living on hillsides and ghettos and so forth. He uh, launched a huge rehousing scheme for the hundreds of thousands of those poor refugees. And, uh, okay, he put in main spending. The, the biggest single item on his budget for all his 10 years was on resettlement. Because he was trying to meet, move people from the misery of, you know, s uh, squatter's huts, favelas, I suppose you'd call them nowadays, from hillside slums to huge housing blocks of unimaginable comfort and luxury. That's what it was. Now, to you and me, that might not look like unimaginable luxury. But you've got to look at it not through our, you know, the, the, the eyes of people like us raised in luxury, but people who started their lives in, in destitute subsistence villages in China, barely enough to eat every day for themselves and their families, disease-ridden, and then oppressed by a, a, a terrible, murderous regime. And then they ended up in the slums. They rather live in cardboard boxes in the, in the rain than where they came from. And then suddenly they're here. And they have two rooms. You mean I've got two rooms? All for myself and my family? Yeah, you've got two rooms. Don't have to share? No. And not only that, you go down the corridor and there's a little kitchen. And you only have to share that with 12 other families. There's a toilet at the end and a washing basin. Again, you only share with 12 other families. How, how cool is that? Maybe 50 people maximum. So... Uh, that was unimaginable, oh, and plus rains, whatever, whatever, sunshine, rain, you're always protected. That's never going to fall down. And by the way, also, <laughs> you're not under threat from the regime. That was unimaginable luxury for the people of that time. Horrible as those things look today. So uh, that was a guy, Carpenthwaite, who did much by doing little. So why am I telling you this story? Well, I think he's an inspiration for any manager. He certainly has been ins inspiration for me. And I asked myself, Simon, what would cope with me? I mean, the challenges of a manager are somewhat different from the challenges of, uh, you know, a finance manager of a, of a seven million uh, person economy. But I asked myself, like people sometimes say, what, what would Jesus say? <laughs> what would cope with say? And I reckon this is what he'd say as a, to a manager. Concentrate on the big things. Set your parameters and objectives for the staff. Provide the support. Remove the obstacles, which very often is the rest of the organization. Trust your people. Give them the freedom to do what you're actually paying them to do. And if you're not going to give them the freedom, you have to say, well, why are you paying them? Uh, keep, yeah, keep monitoring, but keep it light touch but firm. When stuff goes wrong, you take the blame for it. You take full responsibility for the mistakes. When it goes right, the credit goes to your staff and only to your staff, not to yourself. And then you gear your rewards based on the results delivered and what results, indeed, you'll get. So, in conclusion, Cowperthwaite did much by doing little. And as managers, we should also learn to do much by doing little. And uh, I mentioned in the beginning that this is a prequel, uh, because a year ago I gave a little talk called Manifesto for a Manager. Uh, that might, for those of you here, might just remember that slide. Um, but Cowperthwaite's example has been a, an inspiration to me uh, all my working life. And it is behind this manifesto for manager that, that I developed and I, I, I worked with for, for, for many years. And uh, so that's, that's a slightly perhaps confusing title that I began with. But uh, there you are. That's what I have for you.